Yeah, as you said, my name is Jason Strimple. I work at Walmart Labs. I work on part of the platform team, and we develop internal tools at Walmart Labs to help drive walmart.com. And I actually work at a remote office um, just a little bit up north here in Carlsbad, for those of you who are from San Diego. And like you said, we're going to talk about unit testing uh, client server code. But before we get into that, I just want to do a quick survey and find out how many of you actually unit test your JavaScript code? So 30, 40% about, OK? And so out of you 30, 40%, how many of you enjoy unit testing your code? OK, we got like 10% now or something like that. Yeah, um, I actually hate unit testing code. Um, and I never done it up until a year ago when I joined Walmart Labs. But um, the one thing I found about it is I kind of developed this love-hate relationship with it because I found that I got this um, immediate feedback. You know, I, got, I saw errors in my code before we shipped it to dev stage in these different environments. And it was kind of um, uh, a crush to my ego, I guess, because I thought I'd been writing amazing code for years. And then for the last 15 years, I found out I have all this crappy code just scattered all throughout the internet. And um, I'm sorry, internet. but. Um, so, you know, I found errors there. I started catching API flaws. Like, I assumed, like, all this data would be there for the signatures and whatnot, and it just wasn't there. And so it really helped me shape those um, APIs. And then after we got into code, you know, we got the dev stage. Everything was in production. We'd come back and go to make changes. And, you know, I started to catch these regressions. And then so I started liking a little bit more. I still hate the process. It's like, it's just really bad. But I'm probably falling into that 10% out there that kind of enjoys it a little bit more because you see the benefits of it. And like I said, you know, I didn't have experience a year ago. So, you know, I started Walmart Labs, and then there was just all these, this terminology people were throwing around like TDD, BDD, test harness, test runner. And I still really don't quite know what these are, but I kind of fake a conversation now. <laughs> so I, I got over that, and then I started, okay, so I, I kind of got my head wrapped around this. What, what's up next, okay? So then I said, all right, well, let me see what's powering all this stuff we're doing. And at some point in time, all of these libraries have been in our, um, our code base. Some of them are still there, some of them are gone. But um, the reason for that is because we were a brand new remote office. And you know, for the first year, we were trying to define our process. We had people who were new to Java, uh, or new to JavaScript. They were Java engineers, really smart guys, but they'd never done unit testing before. And so what ended up happening is, is that you know, we're a full stack JavaScript shop, but we ended up with this kind of um, two diversions, you know, two different test runners and things like that. And then, you know, we kept swapping all these pieces out. And we ended up with this really horrific life cycle that nobody could follow. And there's all this bunch of glue code holding things together and whatnot. Nobody could really understand it. Um, you know, we had a gigantic config. I don't even know. I can't even describe the size of the config. It was just really, really gnarly and hard to understand. And so I finally got to where I could, okay, I can kind of write unit tests now. I can kind of get in there and work and I kind of understand what's going on. But then what ended up happening is we changed our development environment. And like I said, we were a full stack JavaScript shop. But we had you know, this, this line drawn between the client and the server. And so on the server, we were running CommonJS. And on the client, we were running AMD. And so we had these, these two different ways of executing unit tests. And then on top of that, you know, we found out, OK, well, why not share code between the client and the servers, both JavaScript? And we found ourselves needing to repeat the same life cycles in the two different places. And so we said we stepped back. And you know, our manager was really cool. He said, OK, well, if you could write this all over again, how would you write it? And so we were allowed to write this new framework that runs on the client and server. And so basically, as a, as a developer, you can come in. You can write your models once, your collections once, your controllers once. All your views run at one time, and the framework just decides where it's optimal to run it. And so we're like, OK, great. We have this new amazing framework. We're going to start building applications with it. And then we stepped back and said, OK, well, this is, this is cool and all, but now how do we test this? How do we test the framework? How do we test these applications? What do we do? And how do we avoid these mistakes that we made in the past? And so the first thing we said was, OK, well, we need to unify the testing framework. I want to be able to come in and just write one single command, like a test command, write the command line. And I want that to be based off a configuration object versus all these different nasty life cycles I was trying to follow in the past. And so that was the first step in the process. And then we said, OK, well, we know we want it unified. Now we need to come up with a set of requirements. <clears throat> and so the first set we came up with this is we want the specs to be agnostic. And so I want to write a spec once. And I want to be able to run on the client server. And I want the spec or the framework that's driving the spec to abstract the differences between the, um, the two environments. I don't really care about it. I want to have to write HTML files, wrap the spec, do all this kind of boilerplate code just to get it running in both environments. We've done that in the past. It's not something that we wanted to repeat. And then the second piece here, which is a really big piece for us when you run AMD code, is mocking modules. 
So if I have module A and it has a dependency on, say, module B, I want to be able an easy way to mock that by just using the pass ID so that when it executes, it'll just pull in that module B and mock it. And that's for things like if it's just it's you know doing crazy network calls or something like that that you can't actually achieve when you're running your unit test. And so we want a way to be able to easily do that. And then on top of that, one thing that we found was that we wanted to be able to mock global objects easier. Because you'd have maybe say, maybe say you have 15 specs lined up to run. And spec one takes this global object, does some modifications to it. And then somewhere down the line, spec nine breaks because of something they did in spec one. So we wanted to be able to mock global objects and then have those cleaned up between each test so that they wouldn't get any kind of corruption in between it because it's really hard to track down who actually just corrupted that global object and called these, caused those other unit tests to fail. And our next major requirement was that we wanted to be able to resolve and automate. And so that's meaning like we, um, <coughs> we want to basically be able to load assertion and testing libraries automatically across both environments. And so we I think we load like sign on, um, chai, or we own sign on chai, chai, should, and all these different libraries. And they're just available for us on our unit tests. So we can focus on the unit test versus the wiring. And then part of this resolution process was just taking your, your application paths and resolving them for you, your spec paths and resolving them for you, your mocks paths and resolving them for you. And all you have to do is write a simple configuration object to do that versus, you know, the 700 lines of code that we had trying to drive all this together. We kind of wanted that out of the picture and just that simple configuration object. And another part of this was is that, like I said before, if I write a spec, it's just a simple JavaScript spec. But if I want to run that in the client, it's going to have to run an HTML file. So we wanted to create a template that would load that spec take all that configuration that happened, all that resolution for the paths, and generate an HTML file that I could then run in PhantomJS, and then I could load in any browser to easily do cross-browser testing. And our last requirement was code coverage. And so this goes around um, the fact that we need to generate L-Cove reports. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with L-Cove, but L-Cove is just a kind of a standard way of generating code coverage reports. And then another application will take that and make something that's hu human readable, like an HTML file or something like that. And so we wanted that to be part of the process, too. Um, so what we came up with is called Grunt Castle, and it's a new Grunt plugin. And basically what it does is it handles all those requirements and what rewires all those paths, does all those things for you. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can just, you know, take your task and your target, write the configuration, execute one line of the command, and it generates, it executes all your unit tests for you and handles that. So uh, at a very high level, we're in, I just want to go through, like, the, um, the major pieces of it. And the first part is the specs. And so this is what you're writing to test your modules. And so the first part of a spec is there's a setup process where it, it loads a lightweight wrapper. And this wrapper wraps up Squire.js, is what's underneath the covers doing all the mocks for you. And then so you don't have to be familiar or configure um, Squire or anything like that. And it's the one that's doing all those kind of path resolutions at runtime for you inside your, um, when your server specs are running, your HTML or your client specs are running. And the second part of this is, is that um, it does the mocks too. So it takes the mocks. It injects all this stuff into the required JS configuration, so you don't have to even worry about um, configuring required JS. It's just doing it all for you. And then the last part of this is it, it runs Mocha right now, both on the server and the client, so then it just executes your tests like any other Mocha test would run. And then the next major part of this is the, um, the testing part. And so this is where I'm going to come in and write, you know, just type in the grunt castle at the command line, and this is where it's going to execute my tests. And again, there's a setup process to it. And that's where that's adding these um, global libraries to the, um, the environments for you. So you can access them directly in your specs. It's resolving paths. It, again, it's configuring required JS. And it's dumping this into the, this castle object that's available in both environments. And then it executes a server test. And so when that happens, it's taking all your specs you've written. And then it's loading them up, queuing them up. And then the test runner is executing these. And then the other part is a client test. And so that's where it's taking the specs, the same specs that you've written. And then it's resolving them to those HTML files and configuring for you and creating those for you. And so that's the major parts of testing. And then this last part is the coverage part. You can think of coverage as having the same life cycle as tests with just a few different um, a few differences, which are just basically, so when I go to execute my unit test, um, the first thing I want to know, I think people have talked about instrumenting code already during a couple times, and I think one of the keynotes talked about it. But Basically, I want to say my application code lives in the folder named lib, and then I want that code instrument and dumped out to libcub. And then so when the unit tests run, what it does is it says, here are your application file paths. I'm going to now resolve those instead of pointing them to your original code. I'm going to point those to the instrumented code for you so you don't have to worry about resolving those paths. And then when it executes, it generates the code coverage reports for you. 
and then it dumps them into an, an HTML file for you so that you can, load, um, you can load that locally and start working with that so you can kind of see where you have gaps in code coverage. And then once you do that, identify that, you can make changes and then actually submit the code to GitHub or whatever it is and push those up to your different environments. <clears throat> okay. So now we're going to take a look at some code after we look at this, I guess, 8-bit dancing awesomeness. But um, how many of you are familiar with Grunt before we get into that? Okay, so a, a good portion of you. Um, people are probably going to cringe when I make these comparisons, so I apologize in advance. But if you don't know what Grunt is, you can think of Grunt as being akin to Ant in the Java world in a sense, or Ant that is, where Ant is a task runner. It's consuming XML files to run these tasks for you, like build processes and things like that, whereas Grunt is for JavaScript projects. And what it does is it consumes a grunt file in the grunt configuration object, and that's, that's executing your task against your targets and things like that. So, and we got great resolution here. And windows everywhere, all right. This is awesome. Okay, so before we dive into the code, I'm just going to kick it off the process. And so this is how you execute your unit test. If you only have one target, then you just write this command in grunt castle, and then it's going to start executing your server and your unit tests on your client unit tests automatically for you. And so this is the configuration file, the grunt file for the Lazo project that I was talking about, which is our new client server framework. And you know, you got some utility functions at the top, and then here's the configuration part of it, and this is what you use to configure your task. And so, for example, this is our required JS configuration for bundling up our lib file for the, the framework. And then down here is the castle configuration, and the target is Lazo, which is the project. And then under Lazo, there's an um, options object. And this first set of options is um, under there's the mocks, and so this is saying, okay, well, for, for this target, my mocks reside under this test directory under mocks. And so this is um, the Lazo global object, so it's just a really simple mock that we'd use in some of our specs. And then, for instance, another example is the request. And so this is what we use to kind of stub out and mock our requests for our models and collections when our unit tests are running. And then the second option here is specs. And so the first property in this is your base URL. And this is just saying, okay, well, my specs live here, and the reason we need that base URL is because it allows us to do all that path resolution for you. And then the second one is client, and you're saying, okay, well, here's where my client-only specs live. And so if you don't even have AMD on the server, you could use this to actually execute client-side unit tests only. And the second one is saying, okay, well, here's you know where my server specs live, and then here are my common specs. And my common specs are ones that run across both environments, so that when my server unit tests execute, it merges these common specs in. Same thing with my client, I can merge them in, and it does it for you automatically, and it queues these up and runs these. And this next property is the required JS configuration. And this is the configuration for your application. So here's where you define your paths, load in, kind of anything you're stubbing out or anything like that, just any kind of required JS configuration that you'd have for your application would go here. And you can differentiate between the client and the server in case there's, you know, obviously there's environment differences that you need to account for when you're running those two different um, environments. But for us, it's pretty simple. We have a base URL for both environments, and we have a function that retrieves our paths out of this paths JSON file. And so, you know, we have IDs that map to paths, and then it does a couple of manipulations that, for things that are unique to the Lazo application. And then this last one is uh, the reporting. So this is where you're going to, this last option down here. And so this is where you define kind of like your, um, your code coverage. You're saying, well, my application lives under lib. For coverage, I want the destination to be libcov, and I want to exclude this directory. And some of this is going to change in the future, which I'll touch on a little bit later. But then there's also things like, for instance, we, um, we bundled up um, Plato so you can take a look at your code and see you know, the code complexity of it and see how maintainable your code is and things like that. But um, again, these things will probably move out in the future into smaller modules because this plugin's a little bit large, it's trying to do too many things at once, and so it, um, it limits the kind of use cases you can handle, but I'll touch on that in the future. And so back to the command line. Um, <clears throat> so here's where all of our server tests executed. So it kicked those off, came through, and then now it's writing out these HTML specs. So it's taking the specification, which I'm gonna show next, and it's generating those HTML files based upon those specifications that you determined run in the client. 
and so it writes those. Then for each spec, it fires up Mocha, like Mocha Phantom JS, and kicks it off and, and executes your test for you. And so it went through all that. And then, so here's what a spec looks like. And so, like I said, we use Mocha. Um, and the top of it, there's some boilerplate code that you could probably actually abstract out into something else and have some kind of preprocessor or something if you didn't want to write this boilerplate code. But it's, it's 12 lines of code, and it's going to be a little bit different for each spec, so we didn't feel the need to do that at this time. And so in, in Mocha, you have the ability to say, well, before each unit test runs, execute this block of code. And this block of code that's executing is asynchronous. So I'm going to give you a function back that you can say, okay, hey, my asynchronous code is done running. I can now go ahead and proceed to execute my unit tests. And so it automatically loaded required JS for me. I didn't have to worry about how it got there. It's just there because Grunt Castle loaded it for me. And so it loads that, gives you a pointer back to the Castle library. And then Castle really has one main method on it, which is just called test, and it accepts an object. And the first part of this object it, object it accepts is the module that I'm testing. And so I only have to give it the ID. So if I go back to my pass configuration here, you'll notice this is just the ID for the module. I don't have to worry about what the path is. And I don't have to worry about if this is going to change on the server. I don't have to worry about if it's going to change on the client. It resolves these paths for me automatically so that I can just sit there and, and you know, type in IDs versus long paths and worrying about how all these are getting resolved because it's a huge pain. The second option to the test function is, OK, now this is where I'm saying, here are the global objects I want to mock. And so I can pass an array of objects and tell it where I want this object attached into the global namespace. And so in this case, it's just um, going to all uppercase lazo. And so this is where, you know, like I said, this executes for each test. So each test gets now a clean copy of this global object. So none of the specs break, none of this, you know, the tests within one spec break down the line because it has a fresh copy of this global object. And so once it's done all that, a callback executes, gives you back a pointer to that module, that context module. And then we're assigning it back to this variable that was defined outside this closure so our unit test down below can have access to it. And then we tell Mocha that we're done. All our asynchronous code is done. Go ahead and proceed down and start executing these unit tests. And if you're familiar with Mocha, um, these shouldn't look uncommon to you, but the one unique thing that I want to point out is down here is that it loaded Chai for me. And so now, if I'm on the client, if I'm on the server, it's just there for me automatically. I didn't have to worry about loading all these things. I could focus on writing my specs and making sure that my module is actually unit tested very well. So I mean, I'm not going to go into all this, but this is just testing. Basically, this is testing our, our context object in the framework. And in Lazo, the context object is a um, is an object that gets passed around with these requests. So a request comes in. It says, um, you know, I need these models. I need these views. I need these templates to complete, complete this page request. And then so it takes that object, goes through your life cycle on the server, serializes it, sends that back to the client, and the client says, thank you, I, know, I now know how to draw this page. But um, it's, it's a really simple object, so there's not too many unit tests on it. But hang on one second here. So we're not going to be able to see all this because the resolution, but you, you can't really get a, a a good understanding of what this is actually doing for you at runtime on the server because it's doing all this in memory. But when it writes these HTML specs out, you can see that it's resolved all these paths for me. So all this stuff I would have had to done manually or kind of you know write my own library to handle there's some one on off functions. It's done this for me. It's taken my paths for me from my application. It's resolved those to run across both environments. It's done the same thing for my specs. It's done the same thing for my mocks. And it's done the same thing for those global libraries that I want there for testing and assertion and kind of supporting my unit test. And it takes all that, does a bunch of configuration, configures required JS for me with all that information, sets up Mocha, loads these libraries like I was talking about. And then this little snippet of code here um, says, OK, well, if I'm running, if I just execute the command the command line, then now it's going to run Mocha Phantom JS. But if I'm loading this in the browser, it's just going to kick off Mocha for me automatically. And up at the top here, you can see that it had loaded, it, it had resolved the path. So it says, that's the kind of one of the cool things it does. So, you know, I'm running Node, and I don't know where my modules are. I don't know where they resided. Somebody could have installed the module, you know, 20 directories up, but I still need to resolve to that path. And so it's resolved these paths for me. So, for instance, you know, RequireJS, which it loaded for me, lived at this level because we use that directly in Lazo. But we don't use, um, what is this over here?
Okay, I can't see it, but we don't use this actual module within Lazo, and so it resolved it down there for me. So it, it basically goes through and does like um, a command for for Node and tells me where the module resolves to, so I can do that. And doesn't really matter where I've installed that module at; it's resolved it for me and loaded into this, and again does this on the server and the client. All right, so I mean that's that's basically all the code and how it runs in a nutshell. Um, so what's up next for this? So one of the things is, like I said, we want to narrow the plugin's focus. We, you shouldn't have to have an instrument in your code because you can get to some complexities with that. So what we ended up doing is, is what we need to do is we need to rip it out because right now we're using JS coverage. But as you saw in our earlier presentation, JS coverage really doesn't account for branches in your code. So you might want an instrument or something like Istanbul or something like that. And then Castle should just take it and say, OK, well, I want to run unit test against this file or this directory. I don't really care what it is. I don't care if it's your original application or not. But if you want LCOV results, just you know, in your configuration, tell me that you want a, a different reporter, and I'll give you that. And so we've got to simplify it like that. And the, <clears throat> excuse me. And the next thing we want to do is modularize and define the contracts. Um, this is the first Grunt plugin I had written, and so um, it's probably not the cleanest code in the world, but what would be nice is if, if you run Jasmine as your test runner, that we have some kind of clear API that you could load Jasmine versus Mocha so you don't have to rewrite your specs or anything like that. That would be a nice feature. But before we can even kind of think about and contemplate how to do that, we need to clean the code up and get the APIs nice and um, defined well. And the next thing we want to do is, you know, make it, make it able for you as a developer to pick and choose your, your testing, like your supporting libraries and your searching libraries. Like I said, we, we load sign on chai, chai and should. But what if you don't want those? What if there's other things you want to load? Or you should just be able to give like a module ID and a version, and it should resolve it for you and go ahead and make it available for you in each of your specs. So like with Chai, I didn't have to worry about that. But whatever it is you don't want to have to worry about when you're writing your specs, you should be able to load that automatically. And then, and here's the, I guess the most embarrassing part is that we don't have any unit tests for our unit testing framework. Um, I don't know if that speaks to my hatred of unit tests or, or not, or if it's more just speaks to the kind of development cycle we're marching against. But um, this link here won't work right now. We're going to open source it either today or early next week. But if you want information on it, I'll probably post something to the, um, the JQCon hashtag to let everybody know when it's available. But it'd be nice if people could take a look at it, you know, fork it, download it, start messing around with it, and provide some feedback. We'd really appreciate that. But um, I am done talking. This is probably the most talking I've done in the past year, so I'd rather open it up for questions to you guys. But 